first wave of the pandemic ended is we, as I say, we were reminding local authorities of the importance of carrying out their individual assessments, but we didn't want to interfere in any way, on either side of the argument, um, between local authorities making those, um, uh, those individual assessments about eligibility of those subject to that, to that, um, to that condition. I do, I do recognise this is a, um, um, a complex area, though. Okay, so just sorry, I just just want to make sure on that final point. So, so whilst there was certainly wasn't a quantum that was put in place, would you say it was an aim for those people that are classed as no recourse public funds to perhaps be restricted from accessing the everyone in support as a result of that letter? Just so I'm understanding this, well, I just want to make sure that I'm getting it absolutely clear. Um, I th I, I'm not sure. I, there's much that I can add to what I've. I've previously said we were reminding local authorities of their um, uh, of the importance of carrying out individual assessments for um, for those in emergency accommodation. They should continue to provide support that's required by the by the law. And obviously, um, when the pandemic's been at its peak, it's not been surprising that the local authorities have, have rightly decided that that they should support um, those. Um, in this group, but we're asking authorities to make individual individual assessments. Okay. Um, do you have any data on the number of people that are classed as no recourse to public funds currently being supported through everyone in? The department doesn't have data on um, um, on that group precisely. Okay, because um, I've spoken um, with the West Midlands Combined Authority Homelessness Task Force that do a lot of work in this area. Um, they do have that data um, and they, they keep that data. I'm, I'm quite concerned that the department wouldn't have that data. So it does appear that on the ground locally that data is somehow being collated. So can I just ask Mr Poppington, what work is the department trying to do with, with stakeholders to obtain that? Because it is clearly important data there that needs to be acquired. As I say, regional agencies do seem to be somehow being able to manage that. I mean, the WMCA told me they, they estimate around 200 people they, they've had as, that were classed as NRPF. So I'm just curious as to what work's being done to, to grab that data. Mr. Poppington. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Bailey. We, we have um, a lot of work in the department to improve our data on rough sleeping and homelessness. Um, I think the specific picture on on the collection of NRPF data I, my understanding is it, 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 it's very variable um, collecting that specific piece of data hasn't to date just to be um, hasn't to date been our um, uh, our priority given the hugely important other um, exercise and work we have underway to improve data um, in the department also okay um, just in terms of just 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 one point that's been been raised with me, particularly by my local stakeholders, is you know obviously at the moment, you know local authorities are, are assisting people that are classes no recourse to public funds under a public health need. When that public health need ends, what do they do? They just turf them out because that and that is the question that was put to me by my local authorities in those words yeah. i'm not paraphrasing there do we just turf them out because we don't actually know what to do and our monitoring officers and our legal officers are screaming at us at the moment saying that really we're probably in breach of our, our, our legal restrictions so i'm just curious to to understand what guidance would come from the department on how to deal with that situation mr Paul. thank you mr Bailey. i do i do understand the sensitivity and the, the complexity of this of this um, uh, of this area, um, what we're asking um, local authorities to do is to use their is to use the options that they have available within the um, uh, within the, the the law, and it depends on the precise immigration status of the individual rather than just whether or not they have a no rec whether the individual has a no recourse to public funds condition attached to their immigration status, the support that they can provide, the extent to which they can provide, um, in some circumstances, um, a, a, accommodation where there's a risk to life and to other circumstances as well for some, some people, support also for reconnection with family and friends, 
Um, in some cases, for some of these groups, some basic employment support as well may also be possible. Um, there's also support, um, of course, ultimately for support with voluntary returns once the pandemic eases and that sort of option is, 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 a, is available. There's also, um, finally, of course, for those who could benefit support with the EU settlement scheme and support to help people resolve their immigration status. So there are avenues open. There are a number of other actors in this space as well from the wider voluntary sector are also supporting this, um, uh, this, this, this group. But obviously, of course, um, authorities need to act within the, within the law. But surely, Mr. Pogginson, I'm just, I'm, you know, uh, I'm like I see Baroness Casey probably wants to come in on this as well, but surely, Mr. Pogginson, um, you know, the department's written to councils in, on the 28th of May saying, basically, you know, you need to be careful of what you're doing. You are restricted in what you do. You can probably appreciate why local authorities are a little bit reluctant, perhaps, to necessarily go, go alone in terms of acting this. So what I suppose what I'm really trying to say is, whilst I hear what you say, it sounds to, certainly from my local authorities, they want guidance from the department. They want to know what they can do because, you know, we've, we've got examples, for example, I think in, in, in London, for example, there's 2,000 people ineligible for benefits because they're NRPF. I mean, how do you deal with that? You know, what do you do? How do you deal with those people? You know, how do we do it in a safe way? And what support is the department going to give the local authorities to coordinate that response? I, I do appreciate the complexity. I'm just probably probably the last thing from me on this is to is to, to say obviously we are in a period of of of, um, of essentially lockdown at the at the moment. So I think at the moment, the, in the vast majority of cases, the, 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 this is probably not a current live issue for, for for councils given the risk to life where the pandemic is. It's their decision, but that's I'm sure the decision that most are um, are, are, are making. But um, um, the, as I said. I've, I don't, don't want to go around in circles, but as I've said, the, the, the complexity of this is understood in the department. Okay. I mean, I think it would be, I, I certainly think there is probably a, a scope for their chair for the department to to look at this. And as I say, councils are crying out for, for some sort of guidance on this. Um, if I could just ask one more point around um, no recourse for public funds, that's actually Baroness Casey. Um, I don't, Baroness Casey, one of the things that's been brought up with me is around this circle of vulnerability. So quite often you'll find people that are no recourse for public funds who in normal times would be going into sector who have been supported um, to, to, to obtain work as part of that sort of homelessness um, combating homelessness that would go into sectors that at the moment are closed as a result of COVID. Now, one of the big concerns from my local stakeholders is that there is a real risk of exploitation of a lot of, of, of people with no recourse to public funds, which then in turn starts a cycle where then people are exploited and then come back because they end up homeless again and they come back and there's additional pressures then on local authorities to, to provide that support. I'm just curious what your take is on that, whether, whether you've seen that you know, through your experience, both in and outside as well, with the work you've done and uh, sort of your, your perspective um, on that analysis. Well, my perspective on the conversation, uh, the, the, on the evidence you've just been hearing is, you know, the thing about rough sleeping and more broadly homelessness is it is cross-departmental uh, and has, um, you know, it, it, one of the difficulties in this particular thing is actually it is an immigration policy which is much broader than anything uh, that DCLG, MHCLG colleagues are able to manage. So it, the guidance is clear, uh, actually, to local authorities, which is unless there's a risk to life, then they cannot help those people. Um, and that's why the growth of these communal night shelters throughout uh, England uh, took place. It's actually when we looked at the people coming in from those nightly bed uh, mattresses on the floor shelters all over the country lots of those people were people that were here legally uh, some were working some were not working but they couldn't get recourse to public funds and actually what's happened is you know to be honest it would be great if you could level all of the questions you've just leveled at the permanent secretary of mhclg at the permanent secretary of the home office because actually it is a home office policy that has got us into this place on numbers you know i'll be brutal and the chair has um, witnessed me uh, at previous public accounts committee the truth is nobody really wants to know those numbers mr bailey because if you know them you have to do something about them and I estimate, in my own view, that you'll be talking upwards of several hundreds. It won't be 200 in London. It might be 
closer to 2000. Um, and at the moment, nobody can do any of those, anything with those people in an onward way, because once the threat to life is removed, then actually, uh, really, local authorities can't help them. So, you know, the guidance that you're asking colleagues in MHC to produce is there already um, and it's very clear that during the first wave of the pandemic um, it, we were really clear that everybody had to come in I remember having a call with somebody saying look it doesn't matter if they're Portuguese if they're from Bromley or if they're from Portugal the disease might get them and we need to get them in and into a place where they can self-isolate now as the the lockdowns okay. become more complicated and tiered and this and that and the other that's harder for local authorities uh, to deal with and um, but at the, you know, at the end of the day if we knew what those numbers were you know there's a part of me that thinks why don't we just find a way to get them to be able to uh, work here and stay properly um, we try to get people in the London hotels um, two things one was employment uh, advice uh, in fact some of Penny's esteemed team actually rang around a bunch of farmers that were advertising for um, uh, uh, fruit picking. Uh, I saw the DEFRA fruit picking okay. initiative and tried to get them jobs the same way uh, people have been paying for immigration advice in, in the hotels in order to fast track people who could have papers and be here legally. The point I'm making, I'll shut up after this, is this is so cross-departmental and it isn't something that MHCLG colleagues can literally work wave a magic wand at. It would take a cross-departmental approach to it to sort it out. Thank you, Baroness Casey. Chair, I will leave that point there for now. Thank you. Thank just you. one quick question to Jeremy Pocklington um, off the back of what you've just said. Um, as the NEO highlights, there are discussions, and you're talking about discussions with the Home Office about this knotty issue, which is a policy that has clashed with COVID in spectacular fashion. What's the outcome of those conversations with the Home Office? Has there been any progress on it from this perspective? I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm well, Chair, just, forgive me, I'm not sure exactly what you're, to which, I'm mean, obviously we're in regular dialogue with the Home yeah, Office about yeah, this. Yeah, but is there any pro, well, okay, you can talk to the Home Office about it, but it's not much good if nothing changes, is it? And, you know, so we've got, as Mr. Mr. Bailey has very clearly highlighted, confusion out there, as the NEO highlight in their paragraph 211, um, you know, councils um, making tough decisions or on ceasing uh, to take in use rough sleepers who are ineligible for benefits because they, they felt they were confused about your interpretation. So obviously you're discussing this with the Home Office. Are you getting any clarity from the Home Office that, that can give, make, help you give clearer information and advice to local authorities that will actually help people over the challenges that uh, Mr Bailey has very clearly highlighted? And as, I, as Dr Baroness Casey has, has uh, indeed as well. No, and as, look, as, as far as I'm aware, there are no, there are no plans to change um, if you like, the, the immigration status of, of, of these, um, of, of those af affected by um, NRPF. What we're doing is um, trying to support local um, authorities in uh, working within the law as it, as it stands. Okay, well, there we, there we have it uh, so far for now. Um, over to Mr. James Wilde, MP. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Pocklington, in the first six months of the programme, um, as it touched on, 33,000 people were helped into accommodation. Um, the official snapshot figures were only recorded 4,266 um, people sleeping rough in 2019. How do you account for the, the vast difference in those figures? Thank you, um, Mr. Wild. Um, I think um, I might hand over, if I may, to Penny on questions on, on data, but the, the, head, the, just the headline from me is the snapshot figure is a, um, is a measure of the stock um, over um, essentially at a moment in time uh, in autumn 2019, whereas the 33,000 number includes the flow over, over time. Um, given the fluid nature of this population, it's not to be it's not surprising that there is a significant difference between the two numbers. Okay, Ms. Hobden. Yeah, so as Jeremy outlined, these are two different sets of figures that are doing different things and counting different things. The, um, the annual snapshot takes uh, either an, an estimate, either count-based or evidence-based estimate of, of the number of rough sleepers on a single night in the autumn. And um, we don't, we, we fully understand that that doesn't uh, 
demonstrate the number of rough sleepers across the course of the year, but what it does do is provide a robust and measurable um, moment in time that can be compared year on year. Um, the 33,000 that we had supported either into emergency accommodation or into move on settled pathways by the end of November um, is, is a different number. It, obviously, it's cumulative of people who've been supported across those months and it included both people who were sleeping rough and those who local councils deemed to be at risk of sleeping rough at, at the point at which they presented themselves to the local authority. Mr. Wild. Okay, but how, how many more people would you would you say predicted that um, slept rough than over the course of an average year than are recorded in the in the snapshot? And I take the point it's a snapshot. Then. Um, so there's no official estimate of the of the number who would sleep rough over the course of the year. So there's no kind of population level data, for example, of the number of nights that rough sleepers spend uh, sleeping uh, sleeping rough. Um, so we don't have a, an estimate of across the course of the year in, in that way. OK, um, the report notes that um, the department's estimated the proportion of the people who presented to local authorities were not actually imminently at risk of rough sleeping, which I, I think was a test. I mean, how many people do what proportion of that 33,000 do you think weren't actually at risk of um, rough sleeping? Um, in the data that we published in um, June, which showed the picture at the end of May, uh, 15,000 people had been supported into emergency accommodation. Uh, we made an estimate then, which we published with the figures at the time, which estimated that 7,000 of those were previously sleeping rough, 2,000 had come from shared sleeping sites, 5,000 uh, were deemed to have been at risk of sleeping rough, and the remainder had come from... Um, the, the 1,000 remaining had been discharged from prison or hospital. So that was the um, estimate made at the time in May. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown. Over to Sir Geoffrey. Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, MP. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, may I echo um, uh, congratulations to everybody for getting this initiative up and running so quickly. And what happened in my local authority in Gloucestershire was that quite quickly they got a significant number of these rough sleepers into hotels, very expensive hotels, and the majority of them are still there. So what is the strategy, uh, uh, Jeremy, to encourage local authorities to find follow-on accommodation? Um, because this hotel accommodation is very expensive and it's not doing the rough sleepers themselves any good. Um Thank you, uh, Sir Geoffrey. I think that you're, you're absolutely right about the importance of providing appropriate move on, um, move on accommodation in the interest of the rough sleepers, but also the, the, the taxpayer. And in essence, that was the objective of the Next Steps accommodation program uh, um, and the rough sleeping task force that began in May and has continued over the summer and um, and beyond. Um, uh, we are providing funding for local authorities, first of all, to provide continued um, interim accommodation where that's appropriate, whether that's in a hotel, perhaps also in the private rented sector, supported housing, reconnection, providing 91.5 million for that. And then in addition to that, we are funding the creation of 3,300 new long-term homes for move-on accommodation uh, um, to be um, available, well, really from now, but by uh, the, the aim is the vast majority online by, by the end of March um, this year. And we have made progress. So I recognise the position in your constituency, Sir Geoffrey, but of the 33,000, we think about less than 10,000, I think, are, um, are now in hotels and the rest are in longer-term settled accommodation, for example, in the private rented sector or social housing, or on a rough sleeping pathway um, in supported housing or you know, reconnected with family and friends. But if um, what, I, what is being reported to me by my local authority is correct, uh, whilst it may be happening in Surrey areas, it's not happening in my area that people are moving on to other accommodation. So my question to you is what more can be done? Our, 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 
our advisor teams um, are, are working with um, individual areas to make sure that as much help and support ca um, that can be provided is being, um, uh, is being provided. We will have f um, further rounds of the rough sleeping accommodation programme. There'll be further support to be given. An additional move on accommodation will be created um, in the um, in the years ahead, the 3,300 that I mentioned is the is the first phase of a total 6,000 unit unit program. So this is a real priority. I think that's an unprecedented amount of move on accommodation that the department is funding through a um, through a program. So it is a real priority. But obviously, there will be areas, perhaps particularly perhaps some more rural, rural areas or towns where it is harder to prov to find and identify suitable accommodation um, locally. Perhaps, um, Ms Casey, can I just bring you in, please, here? Um, uh, th my local authority also report that there, are, there is a proportion of people that won't engage with them or any of the agencies, and that must be particularly hard during this hot, cold weather. Um, w w is there any more that can be done for that category of people? Um, yes, and um, actually it's Dame Louise or Baroness Casey. Oh, I'm so sorry, um, so sorry. No, not at all, Sir Geoffrey. Um, essentially, I, th I think the, the, the point you're making is, is valid, I think, in rural areas where actually we know historically anyway, finding move-on accommodation and build is always more challenging than, say, squeezing more out of places like London. Um, in defence of the department, and I have no reason here today to be in defence or in attack, as it were, I'm just, I'm just here, to have actually moved 23,000 people through the hotel system out of a total of 33 as we speak, with only 10 left in, in, in six months is, to be honest, by anybody's standards, Sir Geoffrey, pretty bloody impressive, actually, I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've got to say. Um, I, I think in urban areas, certainly particular areas like Manchester and London and Birmingham, getting low cost accommodation in hotels was much easier. So the average, I think we were looking in London in particular at 25 to 30 quid a night for that accommodation. But that is not to deny, I don't think at all, I wouldn't want to sit here and say that, that the point you've made, um, it, it, what one wants is to spend money on long-term solutions and coming full circle to your first question, we really want to spend the money on people with long-term needs. I would also say that in places, um, certainly Shrewsbury opened up um, uh, the, the much, much very famous hotel, I think it was called Rupert, um, they have people in, in, in that hotel, because uh, I did a virtual tour of it and, and met, met the team that, do, uh, that, that worked yeah. there, that were extraordinarily vulnerable. You know, in my day, first time round, 25 years ago, when I was a volunteer, they'd be called men of the road. Um, you know, people that have really been out for a terribly long time. So I think we have to seize the opportunity of those people now being in. I think, to be honest, Sir Geoffrey, it is not going to be straightforward in areas like yours to magic up anything really quickly. And I think the permanent sector is right to put its eggs in the basket of those permanent move-on accommodations that should touch areas such as yours. Well, thank you for that answer. But actually, Dame Louise, I, the, the, the specific question I had for you was the proportion of those people that won't engage with either the local authority or any of the other agencies, uh, particularly out in this cold weather. Uh, what more can be done to help them? So, first of all, I think that last year, uh, I think the numbers were down to, I remember thinking, wow, this is, this is extraordinary. We were down to, when I was last the homelessness czar, the numbers were sort of five, 600 people. You're never necessarily going to get anything better than that, Sir Geoffrey. You know, when the coordinator from uh, Birmingham, I was on a call with one of Penny's team with him, and he said, Louise, don't lose, we've got six out. And I went, do you know who they are and where they are? And the question then for us was, do we, were we to force them in? So I think you'll always have some people who you need to keep the door open for. I think it is a fault line that because the department is holding a lot of the responsibility for the strategy on rough sleeping, including, I, I hope you don't mind me saying it, Jeremy, but for the Department of Health, that actually some of the treatment options to the people that are still out um are not as ready available as i would like them to be and um, lastly i'm really pleased you mentioned severe weather over the weekend uh, because the department reopened the severe weather emergency provision 
we will have found people that came in over this weekend that will fit exactly into your group. Um, okay. So I feel hopeful because they have this permanent accommodation coming on that we can we can you know, jump straight to some of those very vulnerable people who are refusing to come at the moment into that. But I'm not going to sit before you, Sir Geoffrey, and say it's a perfect science and you'll get 100% in because as long as we have human frailty and as long okay. as we have frail services, that doesn't always connect up. Thank you. Can I just clarify? I'm sure my local authority know exactly who they are, and I'm not in any way criticising the local authority for their efforts. But thank you for your reply. Thank you very much, Sir Geoffrey. Uh, to uh, Sean Bailey, MP. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, just to begin, obviously, I, I do just want to say I think I think the everyone in the scheme has been a success for the department. I don't think anyone can 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 argue against that. But just 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 thinking forward now. One of the concerns I've had raised with me by some of my local stakeholders is this bottling up that they're a bit concerned might be happening. So that's particularly around, you know, where people were in rent arrears. And obviously those rent arrears have been, uh, uh, you know, there's been those ex extensions or um, uh, sort of the leeway given. There is a concern that we're going to get to a period now where people, some people are going to have 12 months worth of rent arrears. Equally, you're going to have um, landlords and thinking within the West Midlands, you know, we're not talking here landlords with massive portfolios. You're talking Right, landlords have one of the property that's their life savings that now their mortgage provider is getting on their back too, and there is a concern of this this flow into um, homelessness and rural sleeping. Is the impact of that is going to see an increase in, in people that are presenting, and equally with things such as increases in domestic violence, um, family breakups, yep. so, the pressure that's there. So I'm just conscious to, to understand um, from Mr. Pocklington any any modeling any sort of work the department's done on in that area because i can appreciate it's something that certainly is coming down the track and also to baroness case as well any sort of perspective you've got on that whether that's something that you know through your work you've identified as an okay. as, as an issue there and any strategies in place permanent secretary thank you um mr bailey an, an important set of um set of questions and issues and some and, and ones that the department's obviously looking at closely although it touches on the whole of government response to the pandemic and the wider as i'm sure you can imagine the wider economic support that's been offered through the furlough schemes and other interventions to to, to support individuals but in terms of the mhclg specific elements um i would highlight a couple of a couple of things first of all we're monitoring um uh, uh access to statutory homelessness uh, um, interventions closely. There's further data, I think, due out on the uh, com uh, coming out, I think, later this week, actually, uh, for the second half of, of last year. Um, actually, um, overall, in the first wave, there was a decline in the number of people um, approaching their, their housing options teams for, for support. Um, I think compared to what had been forecast, and that I think reflects the success of, in a way, of everyone in, and 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 some individuals perhaps went direct to 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 that, to um, to that scheme. Although the numbers in temporary accommodation have continued to um, uh, continue to grow, more help and support is being offered to single individuals as a result of the Homelessness Reduction Act really um, kicking in. Um, then um, further up, if you like, you, you raise the issue of, of people renting, which is um, um, another really important, and the private rented sector is a, another important issue we, we're monitoring closely. Um, as you know, in the immediate issues around the pandemic, evictions have been, have been banned. That remains the case okay. yep. until the 21st of February when it will be reviewed, yeah. and notice periods have been extended yep, to six months. Again, there'll be, we continue to monitor data um, and evidence around that, um, around that closely. Um, more data will come out on the 11th of February on, um, in relation to um, that, um, th that, that aspect, so repossessions. Um, uh, but it's an area we have to continue, continuously monitor, I think, in the period ahead for the reasons that you, that you, um, that you outline. Ms. Mr. Bailey, did you want to go to Baroness Casey? Yeah. Baroness Casey. Sorry, Chair. I mean, I, I, Mr. Bailey, I don't really have a great deal to, to add. Um, a, a, I mean, I think the upside is the department has, these are people in fixed accommodation <laughs> and we know where they are and we, we can track them from that perspective. I have to say, I think it's a bit of a Hobson's choice, this one for the government and does get, um, 
sort of caught up in what one would do overall with a financial and support package across the population to different cohorts. Loads of landlords are actually very small landlords okay. that have one or two, one property or two properties. You know, they'll be suffering at the same time that you've actually got people yeah. that okay, literally yeah. have nowhere yeah. to go. So okay. that's the point. Thank you, Baroness Casey. Mr Bailey. Chair, yeah, that's all from me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, James Wilde, MP, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Pocklington, uh, we've, Sir Geoffrey touched on the Net Steps accommodation programme. Um, are you on track to deliver the 3,300 homes by the end of March this year? And how many are already up and running and have people living in them? Um, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Wilde. We're on, we're on, we're, the, the progress making good, very good progress. We're, we think we're on track to deliver the vast majority um, uh, this this year. I haven't got a specific number um, uh, as to how many are in operation. I know some are now being used in Derby, in West Suffolk, in Chichester, so in different parts of the of the the, the, the country. Brighton's another another area, um, but we are we are monitoring um, progress closely. I think you said the, the substantial majority. Did, did Ms. Hobbs and Hobman have any additional data on what that means against the 3,300 target? Uh, no, I don't have any more um, specific data, but we are confident that, that we will deliver those 3,300. Um, and as Permanent Secretary said, some are already in use, particularly where they've been private sector leasing schemes, where, but the vast majority of the 3,300 are um, the new acquisitions or um, refurbishment of moribund stocks. So we expect most of them to be uh, towards the back end of this financial year, given um, given the works that are needed. OK, and how long do you expect people to stay in these homes and, and where do they go um, after that period? So the intention of these homes is that they provide, uh, as, as they describe, move on, a move on step for people in what we describe as the rough sleeping pathway. Um, so the expectation is that people would stay in them up to around two years, although we accept um, and we'll work with local authorities where there's exceptional circumstances where people might need to stay in them longer. But the intention is that they're a, a, the next step on the way to uh, sort of ind independent um, living for individuals. OK, because my, my local authority are providing 16 um, units under under this programme, which is um, welcome. I suspect to them, I know that they're on track to deliver it. You don't seem to have a figure at all about what you expect to be, how many of the 3,300 will be there. Can I just press you, do, how many do you think you'll have at the end of March? Um, so we are confident about the number 3,300 being reached. As uh, the Permanent Secretary said, there may be uh, some that uh, that are completed early in, um, a little, little bit later than that. However, um, it's quite a moving picture at the moment, uh, given that local authorities are now getting underway with um, acquisition and the refurbishment works and so on, which is why I'm unable, unable to give you a, an, uh, a specific figure right now. OK. Um, and at the end of September, the report says 23,273 people um, had moved on into settled accommodation. That was that figure was for the end of September. What do you understand that figure to be um, today? Um, so the figures that we published on the 8th of January uh, were numbers as at the end of November, which was the 33,000 that had been accommodated overall, of which just over 23,000 had been moved on into settled uh, accommodation. So those are the, the most the, the most recent figures that we have published from the end of November. OK, do you have um, figures for how many of the people who moved on from hotels and other accommodation have subsequently returned to um, sleep rough? No, we don't have uh, a figure in the public domain for those uh, for for that specific question. Would you like to put one in the public domain today? Uh, no, as um, as the NAO report refers, the the department's been gathering management information during the course of the pandemic. These are new data sets that we are continuing to refine at the moment. Okay, when, when would you expect them to have been refined to be published? 
uh, as as I said, the new data sets, there's quite a lot of work to do with them to refine them. But as, as when we are able, then we will put them into the public. Are you, are you saying this is a, a statistics authority issue or is it a departmental internal departmental issue about the validity of the numbers? Is that question to me? Yes, sorry. Chair? Yes, because you went to the figures. Ms. Hogan. Um, yeah. Is it, is it about the National Statistics Authority or is it about your department not yet reconciling the figures? I think there's two two issues here. One, as the Permanent Secretary said earlier, is that we have the official statistics yes. being published next month, and it's important that that those uh, are not confused. Um, but there is also further work to be done within the department on the management information that we gathered throughout the pandemic to make sure that that is uh, correct and refined. So just, just to be clear, that management information is feeding into the future national statistics publication or are they already agreed and these are a lower level data in more granular detail? Uh, so the official statistics is the annual snapshot, the, the, the single okay. number. Right. Yep. And that does have a much higher standard of verification, yep. it's independently verified by Homeless so Link and yep. it's methodology to the management information. Okay. Well then I'll throw back to Mr Wilde on the other data then. Back to you Mr Wilde, now we've got that clear. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, one of the other the targets as well is 3,300 um, uh, accommodation under this scheme is the 300,000 um, new homes per year. Uh, in our December report, I think this is probably one to you, Mr Popington. In our December report looking at starter homes, we called on the department to set out how many types of tenure um, of homes will be delivered under this 300,000 target and in, and when they will be delivered. Are you in a position today to um, agree to provide that information? Um, thank you, Mr. Wild. Um, we, we will need to respond to that recommendation through the process of the Treasury Minute um, in, the usual, in the usual way. We're coming to the end of that process in government, so I'm sure we'll be able to come back to that at a future hearing, but I would like to respond through the usual process. Okay, so one, one, one of the concerns with <coughs> is um, some of our constituents obviously will not be in a position to um, purchase a property even with the with various support schemes for government. So what's the role for social rent particularly um, as well for, for people who are moving on from um, the accommodation we're talking about here? No, well, th th thank you. I think the, the importance of new supply is is, I think, well understood, notwithstanding the debate on precisely how to interpret the 300,000 um, uh, ambition. And I think that is recognized in government policy. In particular, last year, we announced the next phase of the affordable homes program that provides nine billion pounds of investment between 2021 and 26, and will provide up to 180,000 additional homes if conditions, um, new homes if conditions um, allow. Um, I think um, we think around half of that number um, will be for rent and at least 32,000 I think for social rent is the, is, um, is the, is the plan. So the, so the government does recognise the role of social rent as part of the, um, as part of the mix. Okay, thank you. Um, Baroness Casey, you, you came into um, the department, or sorry, you, you'd agreed to do this review, although you made the point you weren't planning to do it sort of immediately. Um, do you agree that that review still needs to happen and are you still planning to lead it? Um, I, I still think that uh, probably a, a good look at uh, not only rough sleeping but actually probably wider aspects of homelessness such as uh, particularly families in temporary accommodation who, to be honest, I have worried about quite a lot during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> So I think it still stands uh, as an important thing to happen. I think that uh, both the department and myself have agreed we ought to just let the pandemic and vaccines and those sorts of things go and get sort of much further down the road and let, uh, and, and let sort of time uh, heal some of those very difficult things. And I think it's no secret, Mr. Wilde, again, that actually I've said publicly that I think um, the government ought to actually do a big step back and consider how it should look at many issues uh, that have actually uh, sort of, in my mind, um, cut quite deep into the country around low income, 
rising levels of people on universal credit, so on and so forth, homelessness, and within that rough sleeping. So um, I'm afraid it's a long answer to a short question. Fine, thank okay. you. One of the areas um, in, the, in this review I, I'm interested in is, do you think there's sufficient investment into day centres, for example, they're often the first port of call, um, getting people in to have a meal and then actually sit down and help deal with some of the, the longer term issues that they face. Um, do you think in the past we've invested sufficiently in our day centres? I think if I was going to, uh, to be honest, I think that the whole role of what different services and how they operate around the street should be looked at. My own view is that we ought to be uh, able to create in this country a safety net that is up from the street so that people shouldn't be on the street at all. Um, and that actually what you would do is look at some models like no second night out. Um, I'd like them to be no first night out. And I'd look at the role of day centers and night centers within that. So I think just to sort of write a ticket saying, great day centers, they need more money. We must resource them in my mind would be a mistake looking at what services and how they operate uh, post the pandemic would be a sensible thing to do. Also, Mr. Wild, the level of investment that the department is putting into rough sleeping is actually very significant. Mm -hmm. And one would want to look at what you were getting in return for that investment um, overall. I mean, 700 million pounds when I was in charge of the Troubled Families Programme, we didn't have that size budget and we had to turn around the lies um, 120,000 families with quite a few children involved. So it, it does warrant uh, somebody stepping back. I also think the amount of money that's gone into uh, the voluntary sector during COVID has not been insignificant, not only out of the department, out of DCMS, out of comic relief, out of the national lottery. Okay. Um, it hasn't been perfect, but it's not a small amount of money to keep those projects going. Yeah, no, and our committee is all about bang for buck, so very much uh, agree with you there. Um, Mr. Pocklington, are you, is the department um, on track to deliver the target to end rough sleeping by 2024? Um, thank you. Well, I think we have um, strong foundations to take our work, uh, our work forward to deliver that, um, to deliver that ambition. Our focus right now remains on the, 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 the pandemic, but we have transformed many people's lives thanks to the brilliant work that so many in the sector have done over the past um, over the past year the um, significant improvements being made to accommodation this new national asset of move on accommodation will all will all help um, but the challenge is going to get harder as the parliament um, uh, as the parliament progresses because we are dealing now with the more entrenched rough sleepers who have significant um, mental health problems, substance abuse issues, and um, working hard with this group and, and maybe ex-offenders um, as well is going to need to be um, going to need to be a priority. Okay, and um, what, what do you understand? What's your target of ending rough sleeping? What does that actually mean? How do we measure it? We've talked earlier about the 33,000 people, we've had the 4,000 snapshot. What's the actual metric that you're using that we can then, and the public can then judge and see that you're working towards? Um, no, I completely understand the, 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 the question. And of course, it's just not possible to say that um, there will never be a circumstance where no one spends a night out on the um, on the streets, that the, the nature of the challenge that we've that we've got, the the role of health issues of relationship breakdown, that means there are tragically um, uh, um, that 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 um, outcome is probably never achievable. I think thinking exactly how we will um, will approach that definitional question is something that we will need to consider as we update the rough sleeping strategy. I think we all know. The direction of travel that we need to um, that we need to go. So we've got plenty uh, plenty to be focused on in the in the department, but we will need to return to to, to the question that you raise. Yeah, I think it's important, obviously, a, to, to make sure that you, the resources are there to deliver the target, but that we're all kind of clear on what we're aiming at. Because I wonder if I'd asked you that question um, a little over a year ago, whether you'd have highlighted the 33,000, or you might have pointed to the snapshot data as sort of what the aiming point was. So, um, 
May I just, I mean, I mean ultimately, I think the, 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 both measures, the better measures to focus on is, is to extend the snapshot data, um, um, as I think, but, but I recognize the need for the wider picture as well. Great. 